My name is Philip Slate, and I am going to present some information on teaching and preaching from the Old Testament. Here at BCC, we normally focus on the content of Scripture. That is, how each book is made up and what its content is, what its purpose is. Because if we don't understand the nature of those books, it's almost certain that we cannot do good ministry with those books. <clears throat> so my focus is going to be threefold. I want to talk, first of all, about the importance of uh, teaching as found in the Old and the New Testament. This course is a ministry course, uh, not just a straightforward Bible content course. And I want to focus on what Scripture says about teaching Scripture, teaching the Word of God. And second, I'm going to talk about some of the methods that are involved in that. This would be a minor part of what I'm doing. And third, for the most part, I want to spend my time talking about the way in which we can teach and preach effectively from different types of Scripture, because the Old Testament is made up from different types of Scripture, different types of literature, just like the New Testament is. That is, Paul's epistles are different from the parables of Jesus, and it's important to notice those literary types. So first of all, it's important to notice what the Old Testament says about teaching. Uh, the way in which Israel maintained her identity was to pass on the story of how God had called her, delivered her from Egypt, and so forth. And so shortly after uh, uh, Israel came out of Egypt, the Passover was instituted. This is Exodus chapter 13. And when God gave instructions to Moses about instituting the Passover, he said, this is a memorial to God's deliverance from Egypt. And he said, when you do this and your children ask, what does this mean? Why are we doing this? You're to tell them clearly. You're to instruct your children clearly that this is to mark what God did in delivering us from Egyptian bondage. That was a crucial event, one of the three or four most important events in the history of Israel. And if the children did, grew up without understanding that, they would lose a great deal of their identity as Jewish people. So the Passover event itself was not only a memorial feast, like the Lord's Supper became later, but it was also a serious teaching instrument. And then the children of Israel wandered through the wilderness 40 years, and just before they were to cross over into the land of Canaan, Moses restated the law, and in Deuteronomy chapter 6, he says that you're supposed to teach these things diligently to your children. You teach them when you sit down and when you rise up. You teach them in the way. So once again, the Israelites were taught you're to pass on this information, and you're to do it by teaching as well as by example. But shortly after Israel crossed the Jordan River, again miraculously by the help of God, uh, the instruction was, I want you to take 12 stones from the bed of the Jordan, and here at Gilgal, you're to build a monument, so that in the future, when you pass by and someone says, what do these stones mean? You're supposed to explain, this is when God led us across the Jordan River and brought us into this land that God had promised to our forefather Abraham. It was a monument to mark God's keeping his promises. And it was to be used as a visible means of providing teaching, providing instruction to those who were growing up in the Israelite society. And throughout life uh, in Israel, the history they have after that, teaching was very important. Periodically, a speaker would rehearse what God had done in the past. It's called rehearsal theology. And they would retell the story, sometimes from David on, sometimes from Abraham on to say God keeps his promises. We are a people of destiny. And that was to help them to carry on with their ministry. Or at times, that story was told in order to rebuke the people and to cause them to turn around and to behave differently. Finally, we'll simply notice a passage in Nehemiah. Because Israel was unfaithful to God, he sent them away into Babylonian captivity for 70 years. But he said, I'll bring you back. And he did. And when he brought them back under Ezra, Nehemiah, and Zerubbabel, teaching became an important function. And in Nehemiah chapter 8, the whole chapter, involves a time when Ezra the, the, the priest would stand up and read scripture in the morning and in the afternoon. Simply reading scripture 
We're not exactly sure what part he read, but he would give the meaning. And when people heard it, they would say, Amen. They were sort of agreeing to it. But here they were, fresh out of Babylonian captivity, back into the land that God had promised. And they were reminded that God always keeps his promises. And he said, now you're to be faithful to him. You're to be loyal to the covenant. So that teaching the word of God was a way of reviving the people or causing them to repent and come back. We see it under Hezekiah. We see it under Josiah. So this is just a brief little look at what is stated in the Old Testament about the importance of teaching, but it's found in the wisdom literature as well. That sort of thing means that uh, it's crucial for, it was crucial for the Jews to pass on that information. And when we come to the New Testament, we find a similar emphasis. When Jesus gave the Great Commission, he, after training the apostles for three years or so, he said, I want you to go into all the world. I want you to make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them into the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But that wasn't the end of it. He said, teaching them to observe all that I have taught you. That means an ongoing process of teaching the content of what Jesus said. And that's what we find them doing. The church began on Pentecost. We read about this in Acts chapter 2. And there's one little verse, chapter 2, verse 42, that gives a brief summary of what those earliest disciples of Jesus did. And it said they continued steadfastly in the apostles' teaching, the breaking of bread, the fellowship, and prayer. That's exactly what Jesus said for the apostles to do. I want you to teach everything that I've taught you. And here the earliest church was gathered around listening to what the apostles were saying about the teachings of Jesus. As we go on, we find that one of the purposes of assembly was instruction. 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14 deals with some problems of the assembly at Corinth. But during those, in those two chapters, we learn, learn that a serious purpose in meeting together was that they might be built up through the teaching that would be given. In Ephesians chapter 4, Paul explains that when Christ ascended on high, he gave gifts to men. He gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. This is from Ephesians chapter 4. And he said that those gifts were given in order that they might equip the saints. That is, that through their teaching, those were teaching ministries, they might be able to prepare the saints for the work of ministry. Now, in this case, the saints, the body of Christ, the church at large, was to do the ministry. But they were to be equipped for that ministry so they would know how to do it. And that equipment came through the discipline of teaching. Again, Paul wrote to Timothy in uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, and he said, The things that I have taught you, that I have given to you, I want you to commit to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. So it goes on. What you receive, you pass on. What they receive to be passed on. I'm reminded of a book written by James DeForest Murch that has the interesting title, Teach or Perish. And the history of the Christian movement indicates that's true. When a church stops teaching, stops passing on the message, stops teaching what Jesus taught, it gets in trouble. It tends to depart from the faith. So individual Christians and local churches are to see to it that the message of Scripture is passed on if they want to survive, if they want to minister properly, and if they want to honor God. They will do a good job of teaching. Finally, we'll notice a reference in Hebrews chapter 5. Here the writer, uh, whoever he is, is rebuking the Christians because he said, for a reason of the time, you ought to be teachers. In other words, because of the amount of time that's been involved in your being a disciple of Jesus, you should be able to be a teacher. But you've become dull of hearing, you haven't developed properly, and so you need someone to feed you on the milk of the Word. You're not ready for the meat as yet. Now, that was a kind of rebuke, but in it, we understand that the writer felt that all Christians, to some extent, should be able to talk about their faith. And if a church doesn't equip its members to do that, that church is failing those members because the Word of God is to be taught. 
It isn't just to be read and meditated on, and that's all. It's to be taken in and passed on to others. So the concept of teaching is a very important concept. It was to the Jews, it is to us. We teach or we perish. So, how do we go about that? Just a word about methodology. <clears throat> People learn to learn differently in different cultures. And whatever the, are the best methods of conveying information and making impact on people are the methods that are supposed to be used by Christians. Teaching the Word of God deserves the best effort we can put forth in terms of what constitutes good preaching or what constitutes good teaching in a classroom or what constitutes good teaching even on a one-on-one -on -one basis or one person teaching two or three. Whatever is the best method in a particular culture is what we need to use in order to make that message uh, viable to people, make it clear to people and to have impact. It's clear in Scripture <clears throat> that it was intended to have an impact on people's lives. Read Psalm 119, and I know it's a long one, 176 verses, but when you read through that Psalm, all of which has to do with the Word of God, you pick up a large number of of ideas as to what the Word of God can do in the lives of people. I have laid your word up in my heart that I might not sin against you. I have more uh, understanding than the aged because I have kept your precepts and so forth. It makes us wise, it can protect us from sin, it can give us guidance. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my pathway. So the Word of God is intended to have impact on people's lives, to generate a response and that's the reason why it needs to be taught to people. But it needs to be taught in such a way that it will generate a response. If all we do in our teaching is to pass information like I'm doing now, then we're lecturing, we're not preaching. Preaching and effective teaching are designed to elicit a response from people, to help them not only to understand the content of Scripture, but to see something about the kind of response that needs to come from that content. And sometimes people need help on that. Just like the Ethiopian treasurer who was riding along reading from the prophet Isaiah and Philip asked him, do you understand what you're reading? He said, how can I except someone help me? There are a lot of people in that position. And it's the responsibility of Christians to qualify themselves so they can help people who need help. And a part of that is understanding the text. A part of it is helping them to see the implication of that text, what it means when, you're, when it's applied to life. Uh, so that's what a good teacher is supposed to do. And we want to use the best available methods when we're trying to do that. Uh, there's a book that originally written in English that's been translated into a lot of different languages. It's called The Seven Laws of Teaching. And uh, that's just from a sort of a Western culture perspective, but much of it translates to any particular culture. We pay attention to the law of the student. Who are these people whom I'm going to teach? Are they 10-year-old children? Are they 16-year-old teenagers? Are they young people in their 20s and 30s? Or are they people in their 50s? What background do they have in the Bible? Do they know anything about the Bible? It doesn't matter what kind of degrees they might have or certificates, how much do they know about the Bible? And a good teacher, a good preacher, will be aware of that to know where to begin in the teaching. Uh, so we have to be sensitive about that. And a church, a local church, will fail its people if it doesn't pay real attention to something besides just having public assembly, public worship. Figure out some way in which we might be able to teach responsibly the content and implication of Scripture. Now, having talked about uh, the importance of that. The question is, why preach and teach the Old Testament? Are there not passages of Scripture that indicate that uh, something has been done away that we read about in the Old Testament? Yes, that's true. In Galatians uh, 3 and verse 24, Paul refers to the law as a kind of guardian. Some translations say schoolmaster. A kind of guardian to bring us to Christ. But after we come to Christ, we follow the system of faith, the system of trust in God. So that implies something terminated. The guardianship of the law uh, stopped. 
But it's really when we get to Ephesians chapter 3, beginning with about verse 13, that we get a clearer view of this. Paul made the statement that God is bringing in the Gentiles on an equal basis with the Jews. I know he says in Romans that the Gentiles are grafted in to the, uh, to the olive tree. Uh, that is, Gentiles partake of the benefits of the Jews and God's working through those people to prepare them. But he said he's abolished the law of commandments that made a distinction between Jews and Gentiles. And now, they're both accepted on the basis of trust in Christ. It isn't possible for the Jews to function under the covenant of Mount Sinai and the Gentiles not to function under that covenant for them to be one new man in Christ. So something about the Old Testament was done away or it ceased to be operative. I think the clearest explanation of this is in probably uh, the book of Hebrews, chapters 8, 9, and 10. And it's important to read all three of those chapters to notice that the writer is talking about the covenant that we read about in the Old Testament. The covenant that God made with Israel. He did not make it with the Egyptians. He didn't make it with the Assyrians. He made it only with the Egyptians. I mean, only with the Israelites. And as long as that prevailed, it wasn't possible for people to be one man. But in Hebrews 8, 9, and 10, says, Jesus is the mediator of a new covenant established on better promises. No longer do we have animal sacrifices. No longer do we have the Levitical priesthood. Jesus is a different kind of priest. He offered himself as the sacrifice, as the Lamb of God. The nature of the terms of the covenant are different, and it is for everyone. Because, you see, the original promise to Abraham was that in Abraham's seed, all the nations of the earth were going to be blessed. And uh, that's critical then. But something was done away, and that is the covenant. God had a covenant with Noah, but he didn't repeat that covenant with anybody else. God had a covenant with the Jews. That was uh, the guardian that brought them to Christ. But that covenant is no longer needed as a covenant. But at the same time, the Old Testament is critically important for Christians. And there are several reasons for this. First of all, it's the first part of a two-part story, if we may put it that way. A person who just reads the New Testament and thinks about it is going to ask a number of questions. Uh, what does he mean when, when he's referring to Aaron? What is he referring to when he talks about David and all of that? It's very difficult to understand the book of Hebrews and certainly parts of Romans and parts of Galatians if we don't know the Old Testament. So it affects our understanding of the New Testament. There are many concepts found in the New Testament whose roots are in the Old Testament. So when Scripture talks about Scripture, it's talking about the Old Testament in the first instance. When Paul wrote Timothy and he said, all Scripture is inspired of God and is profitable, in the first instance, we learn from the context, He's talking about the Old Testament, or at least what we call the Old Testament. In Luke 24, Jesus referred to it as the Law and the Prophets and the Psalms. Sometimes they refer to it as the Law and the Prophets and the Writings. That's the way they summarized what we call the Old Testament or the Old Covenant. But that covenant was important. It is the first part of a two-part story. We wouldn't think of going to a play and walk in halfway through and see the second half of it, it wouldn't make very much sense to us. But the Bible as a whole has a storyline, and the Old Testament is the first part of that storyline. There are many valuable concepts whose meaning is originally defined in uh, the Old Testament. The concept of a covenant, what sin is and why sin is bad, the sense of justice and injustice, the nature of God himself, there's a disproportionately large amount of information in the Old Testament on the nature of God compared to the New Testament. That isn't a criticism of the New Testament. It simply means that the New Testament writers were assuming that we would use the Old Testament. They were banking on that block of information that God had already revealed about himself. And so we cut ourselves short, very short, on knowing who God is, what God is like, 
what justice really is. The prophets define that very well. So these are some of the reasons why it is important today for people to get that Old Testament rootage. Now I hasten to add that when we teach Old Testament material, we always need to pay attention to whatever New Testament update is involved. That is um, the idea of sacrifice. God no longer requires the sacrifice of animals as specified in the book of Leviticus. He now has the sacrifice of his son Jesus and it was a one-time sacrifice because it was so adequate. That's an update. The concept of sacrifice in the Old Testament was you give God the best. You give him the first fruits of your grain. You give him animal sacrifices by sacrificing animals that are without blemish. Uh, they are in good health. They're among the best. The point was you give God the best because he deserves the best and he will bless you. That concept carries through and whatever we give God today, we need to give him the best. But the sacrifice itself has changed. No longer do we offer incense or vegetable sacrifices, grain sacrifices and animal sacrifices. That has been uh, subsumed by Jesus himself. Now it is stated in Romans 12 that we give ourselves as a living sacrifice. So we live as a gift to God. But that's an update, and in all cases, we need to raise the question, is there a New Covenant update on this principle that I see in the Old Testament? Some things are not particularly updated, they just carry on. God has always wanted his people to act fairly, to act justly, and he still wants his people under the New Covenant to act fairly, justly. Under both covenants, he wanted people to be truth-tellers because God himself does not lie. And he wants his people to tell the truth. Don't bear false witness and so forth. Uh, don't give a false testimony. Don't be quiet when you should speak. That's all a matter of just fairness. And that comes from the nature of God himself. So in preaching and teaching and making application, we always want to check uh, the, the update. The New Testament writers use the Old Testament very much. In fact, we might, we might point out that in the New Testament, uh, one verse out of every 22.5 is a direct quotation from the Old Testament. Uh, that means the writers of the New Testament banked on that information. Uh, even in the Psalms, which we associate with devotion, and properly so, there are a lot of doctrinal statements uh, scattered throughout the New Testament. Uh, no less than 300 references are made to the Psalms in the New Testament, often in critical matters about who the Messiah was and David's offspring and uh, the resurrection of Jesus, the Messiah, and all of that. So the New Testament writers are aware that we're carrying on with the same faith legacy. This is the continuation of the story, and we don't want to function with just half of the story. So this is the basic introduction as to why we need to teach and why we need to teach the Old Testament as well as the New. Many of the hymns that we sing use verbiage from the Old Testament. Uh, Isaiah particularly has generated so many different hymns. Uh, the Psalms have given us so much terminology to use, not only in singing and worship, but in prayer and in daily life. So we don't want to be bereft of um, the good that we have in the Old Testament. How we go about teaching books or portions of books in the Old Testament depends on the size of the scripture we want to use. In some cases, for example, we might want to teach an entire book. Uh, there's some books that hang together. We don't want to teach just one chapter from the book of Jonah because the four chapters uh, constitute a sustained story and we'll not get, this, get that story if we deal with just one chapter. And there are several books that hang together like that. On the other hand, Proverbs does not hold together that way. Uh, we'll come to that a little bit later. Sometimes we may want to talk about a Bible character, uh, or we might to, want to deal with a whole book, we might want to deal with a portion of a book, or even a part of it. It depends on the, the block of thought that we choose to use. And if we preach a whole sermon on, say, the book of Job, wow, 40 some chapters, uh, we say, how can you do that? Well, it's possible to preach one ser sermon on the book of Job, uh, 
by telling the story very quickly. It's about like riding a bicycle through a museum. We don't read all the details. We don't see all the details. But we can get the overall story, the overall impression. On the other hand, it's possible to study the book of Job in a classroom setting and take several months going through the speeches of Job's three friends and Job's responses to them. But the basic storyline of the book is very crucial, crucial for people to have. We'll return to that in a minute. But the basic point I'm making now is it depends on the size of the biblical portion we're going to treat as to how we organize our material and go about it. Now, I want to illustrate this material by taking different types of biblical literature and showing what can be done with them uh, in preaching and teaching the Word of God. And I want to begin with what's called narrative material. The Old Testament is, consists of about 42% narrative material. That is, uh, it's more like story form. It's more like reading history. In fact, the storyline of Scripture of God's dealing with Israel is found in narrative material. So if we begin with Genesis, then read Exodus, skip Leviticus, pick up with Numbers, and probably Deuteronomy, do Joshua, Judges, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, then Ezra and Nehemiah. If you read those books, you'll have the storyline of the Old Testament coming right up to the period of about 400 years before the birth of Jesus. And that's all in story form. But in addition to that, there are narrative sections in the prophets. Uh, there are narrative sections in the book of Daniel. It isn't all forecasting the future. There are narrative sections found in most of the or the major prophets anyway. Job is a narrative in nature. There's uh, Ezra and Nehemiah are a narrative. So there are narrative sections in a lot of different types of scripture. Uh, of course, sometimes there's poetry. But narrative has its own way of making points. And uh, actually, it's important to function at three levels when we read narratives. Uh, Genesis chapter 12 to 50. It's narrative material. It focused chiefly on Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. There, of course, other characters are involved, but those are the main ones who constitute the line through which Jesus came. But what kind of spiritual points do we make of that? Is that just Jewish history? Well, no. Uh, something serious is going on there. God is beginning to work out his plan work out the promises that he made to Abraham. But how are we supposed to handle that? How are we supposed to deal with the narrative material in Samuel and Kings? Uh, what points are being made in the book of Judges and in Joshua with all of those events? Uh, I'm indebted to some others for calling my attention to three levels at which we need to think about narratives. So we need to understand the narratives in the first instance and to understand the purpose that the author has in mind in recording that material. It's very routine in studying or reading, uh, especially the books of kings. Sometimes they give a long discussion of a king. Sometimes they're just two or three verses on some of the kings of Israel or Judah. And the writer will say he did what was evil in the sight of God or he was a good king. And then he will say routinely, the rest of the acts of so-and-so are found in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Judah, or the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Israel. In other words, what they wrote was selective. It was just a part of what they did in their reign. But there were reasons for selecting that material. Uh, their purposes guided the exclusion and inclusion of material. And so we need to think at three levels. Uh, the, the bottom level uh, is the level of the story itself. For example, the story of Joseph, or the story of Samson, or the story of Jonathan, or uh, any story like that, where you have all the little details that make it a story. Uh, all cultures identify with stories because we know what it means to make a story. We, our family has a story. Our nations have stories. So we're familiar with that form. We're not familiar with all kinds of literature, but we are all familiar with stories. And the thing that gives a story a punch and reality has to do with the details 
Jacob's making a coat of many colors for Joseph. Uh, the envy of his brothers, selling him into slavery, his being thrown into prison. All of those are details at this level. And it's possible to read that story and say, hmm, that's an interesting story. A lot of bad things happen to a good young man. But is that all that the writer of Genesis had in mind? Well, no. And this reminds us that there is a second level. And that has to do with Israel and uh, God's carrying out his purposes with this people of destiny. So all of these small stories, we need to relate to a higher level and say, now what, what does this have to do with God's working out his purposes in Israel? It all begins in Genesis 12 with Abraham. In you, Abraham, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. I will make of you a great nation. I'll make your name great. And I'll bless those who bless you, and I'll curse those who curse you. And when we read this storyline of Scripture, a great deal of it is God's working out His purposes in Israel. To the future, when He says, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Now we get to the end of the Old Testament, and arrows are still pointing forward. There are aspects of that promise to Abraham that are still not fulfilled. So something is on the way in the Old Testament, and we need to relate this, the, the details of these individual stories to a greater context, namely God's dealing with Israel. But we know from a passage like Galatians 3, 8, that says the gospel was preached beforehand to Abraham, had in mind the gospel going to everyone, that there is still a greater purpose and that's God's overall purpose in working with humanity. So how does the story of Israel relate to God? It shows that God is faithful, God keeps his purposes, and so forth. So anytime we deal with an individual section of the historical material, the narrative material, it's important to put it in its context and try to understand what did the author have in mind here? What point was he really trying to make? Was he simply trying to say that Joseph was a fine young teenager who kept his nose clean, so to speak, but had some bad things to happen to him, but he kept his integrity anyway? Well, that's there. But we look for what we might call theological indicators. And several times in that narrative from Genesis 37 to 50, we find indicators that while it looked like a tragedy for Joseph, God was actually working out his purposes. And several times Job said that, or, or Joseph said that. When he made himself known to his brothers, they were frightened. He's now in a position of authority and he could take vengeance on them. But he said, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. In other words, their envy, their selling him to the passing traders and all of that indicated that God was doing something. And he, on another case, he said, I came down here that many people may be saved alive. And when he's ready to die, he says, I want you to promise that you'll take my bones with you when you go up. He knew that he was, he, he was a part of a people of destiny, a people in whom God was working out his purposes. And that seems to be the purpose of the writer of Genesis, to show that God is keeping his purposes and working in the lives of people. So, in the narrative, we always look at the three levels to be as sure as we can that we make the point that the writer of that narrative had in mind when he made the point. We'll carry on from here and deal with some of this narrative material in order to make the point even clearer.